Hey, welcome to Crossbridge Online. We are so excited that you're joining us here this morning. We would love to know where you're joining us from, so feel free in the comments to just let us know you're here and where you're tuning in from. Before we get started, there are a couple of things that we wanna give you a heads up on. First, I just wanna say thank you so much to the dozens and dozens of you who have filled out that survey about coming together in person and the steps we need to take. If you haven't had a chance to fill out that survey, please feel free to go into the description. There's a link there for you. Please click on that in the description and fill that out as soon as possible so we can make the best decisions moving forward as a church. I wanna thank so many of you for giving faithfully to Crossbridge. You continue to help us live out our mission of loving God, loving others, and serving the world. And if you would like to join us in giving to that mission, we would love for you to give online at crossbridgecc.org slash give. Again, I am so thankful that you're here today. So grateful to worship alongside you, all together separate. And I pray that God would bless you, that he would keep you, and that his face would shine upon you as we worship together.
trust what you say That you're good And your love is great I'm broken inside I give you my life Give me faith To trust what you say That you're good And your love is great I'm broken inside I give you my life Dear Heavenly Father, I just pray this morning that, uh, that you be with everybody watching this service, that you be with everybody that watches maybe later in the week, Lord, that you work in our hearts this morning, uh, tomorrow, every day as we go about our, go about our week, go about our work. Um, give us opportunities, Lord, to come together, to maybe be around people that don't think like us, that don't live like us, that don't work like us, that don't worship like us that we can finally start to understand each other, love each other, and live in peace. I pray this in your mighty name. Amen. Good morning, Crossbridge. Do you know how good it is to say that? Good morning, Crossbridge. I have loved doing online worship these past few weeks, but I have actually missed talking to all of you. I spent all of this quarantine mostly talking to youth. Heck, all of my time has been talking to youth and doing youth group online, which has been amazing. But I have missed seeing you guys for the what? This past 12 weeks actually talking to you. Um, and I have to say, well done, church. Well done. I know Pastor Jimmy has said this as well, but I am encouraged by your faith. When all of this hit weeks ago with the stay-at-home order and COVID-19, none of us knew what actually was going to happen. We were all thrown into this midst of confusion and we had no idea what was to come. And church, some of you, decided to dig deep into your faith and you realized quickly that the church was not a building, but the church was truly the people. You began to soap. You joined small groups. You gave more financially to help those in need and those around you. You rose up to the challenge and did not let your faith dwindle. Well done, church. I cannot wait until we are all together in person again, and I truly mean that. But during this time, I am thankful for the hearts of people who have taken this time to grow closer to God in their relationships. But today, we are going to continue in our series, Love Thy Neighbor, and we're going to continue in Luke chapter 10. And actually today, Sammy is going to read for us this passage of scripture. But before we read, can we just pray together? God, thank you. When all of this started, we had no idea what it was going to look like. But I'm thankful that you've called us to you. That the church has not ceased, it has not stopped, but it dug deep and continued to pursue you in different and creative ways. God, today will you give us ears to hear. Give us ears to hear, Jesus. And it's in your name we pray, amen. Here is Sammy with the reading of Luke 10. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, 
Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to a place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Thanks, Sammy, for reading that passage for us today. So far in this series, Love Thy Neighbor, Pastor Jimmy has walked us through week one, unpacking Luke 10, switching up the question from who is my neighbor to how should I love my neighbor? And this switch no longer gives us the option to ignore anyone, but we are called to love. We are called to love everyone. And then last week, Pastor Jimmy reminded us that in Philippians 2, Jesus gave up all his privileges as God when he became human, and that was the beginning of him showing his love for us. If we call ourselves disciples, if we call ourselves Jesus followers, we are citizens of heaven first and foremost, and we have given up our rights and freedoms to pursue the privileges and rights and freedoms of Jesus. This is who we are, church. This is our calling. This is our identity as God's people, that we love God and we love people. So when we read this story, we see a picture of what loving people actually looks like. But today, I want to look at the first few verses of this story. Because even when we, before we can even get into the meat of the story of the Good Samaritan, Before we can even talk about loving our neighbors, there's a discussion that happens right at the beginning of this passage that has to do with all of us wherever we are in our walk of faith. So let's read together Luke chapter 10, starting in verse 25. It says this, And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test. Stop there right away. In those few words, we already see a tension happening already in the heart of this lawyer. It says that the lawyer stood up to ask this question. When, he, when we read in scripture when it says someone stood up, this is a sign of honor and respect. This lawyer standing as he spoke to Jesus was giving him respect and putting it towards Jesus. But also in this conversation, as he stands up to give honor and respect to Jesus, the question he asks is to put Jesus to the test, to test Jesus' motive, to test who he says he is and what kind of teacher Jesus is. So right away, we see that this man's actions and his motives were already in all sorts of conflict. Because as we read the Gospels and the story of Jesus, these leaders, these experts were not for Jesus, but they were trying to test him, trying to trap him to prove that he isn't who he actually says he is. Did you ever have someone ask you a question that goes just deep super quickly? This is truly youth ministry at its finest. Students stand up all the time to ask me a question and I literally have zero idea of what they're actually going to say. You'll get questions like, do you think if I throw my Bible at my sibling, it would hurt him? Or, hey, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? But this is the question, isn't it? Haven't we all thought this? What about life after this? What happens when we die? How do we get eternal life. When you read this, this is the question. This is the question that people are asking throughout the totality of scripture. This is the question that people were asking then, and this is the question that we're all thinking about now. If you are anything like me, it's that question at night that keeps you up when you can't sleep and you're just thinking, overthinking about everything. And we all have an opinion on how we inherit eternal life. We have all gotten answers from many different places. So this lawyer wants to know and is asking Jesus, how do we inherit eternal life? And I love Jesus' response. He says this, what is written in the law? How do you read it? 
basically saying, you are a lawyer, you are an expert. What does the law say? And it says, and he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and with all your strength, with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you answered correctly, do this and you will live. So here we see Jesus's answer. He says, you know what the book says, love God with everything, with your whole being, with your whole life, love God and love your neighbor as yourself. But we can't love our neighbors until we understand what it means to love God. Let me say that again. We can't love our neighbors until we understand what it means to love God. This is what Jesus is saying. He says, love God. But too many times we can get stuck right in that second part, the part of just doing something. Think of the lawyer's question. What do I have to do? This is what the lawyer is saying. What do I have to do to inherit eternal life? I remember having conversations with students, with kids, with adults years ago, and as recent as a few weeks ago, talking about if I just live life right, if I become a good person, will God accept me? Even as believers, people who follow Jesus, we can get stuck in this trying to act a certain way to earn our spot in heaven. Let me tell you this morning that it's not about what we do. The lawyer here is asking, what must he do to inherit eternal life? The truth is there's nothing that we can do to inherit eternal life. We cannot do it on our own merit. Too many times we think if we just live or act a certain way, attend church services enough, curse a little less, give a little bit more money, we can earn our spot in heaven. No amount of good we can do can ever earn our spot or force our spot in heaven. We will always fall short. From the beginning, God set a standard. He showed us what perfection was, and we all, all of us, have missed the mark. That's what sin is. Sin is missing the mark. Sin is anything outside the will of God, what he desires for us. In the book of Romans chapter 3, it says this, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There is not a religion in the world that doesn't agree that there is something wrong with us. We all have sinned. We all have fallen in areas. So by this standard that God set, we already have lost eternal life. We're sitting here thinking about what can we do to inherit it. But when we look at the standards, we've already, all of us, missed the mark. When you read your Bible over and over again, we see that God shows us the way to live. And it seems like humanity just wants to do the opposite. Truly, look at the world currently around us. Look at humanity. Can any of us really say that we deserve a spot in heaven? Can any of us truly say that we are perfect? I think the expert of the law was looking for some security in the afterlife. Just like the majority of our culture, the good news is, I believe we can know, without a shadow of a doubt, the answer to this question. To explore this, I want to take a look at the letter of 1 John. This is toward the end of your Bible. And over this social distancing, quarantine time, along with soaping, I have just dove into reading my Bible. I probably ha read my Bible honestly more than I ever have in my entire lifetime. In times like these, we are going to find the answers we actually need. We're actually going to find them in Scripture. We're not going to find them in the media. We're not going to find them from people's opinions. The answers we need are truly found in Scripture. And during this time, I've been studying this letter of 1 John, and the author John says that when it comes to sin, and remember, sin being anything that is outside the will of God, anything that's not part of God's design or desire for us, John says this, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Now that's a pretty bold statement, but John here is asking for some self-awareness. Can any of us really claim to be perfect? Can we claim to have no sin? Can we really say, can humanity really say, we don't need God? Because if we were really thinking that, John is telling us 
If we really think we don't need God and we live a perfect life, John's saying we're fooling ourselves. We're fooling ourselves. We all have missed the mark. And church, I have to remind you, or if you're listening for the first time, I have to let you know that missing the mark, sin, costs something. There's a price when it comes to sin. If you go back to the book of Romans, in chapter 6, it actually says the wages of sin is death, right? The cost of sin is death. That's how high of a price it is when we sin. The cost of it, the penalty of sin, the cost of sinning is death. So what are we to do? We couldn't do anything. It's about what God did. When it comes to sin, we can do nothing to save ourselves, but that's why it matters what God did. How do we inherit eternal life? How can we go to heaven? How can we live forever with God? Only through Jesus. Only through Jesus. Sin has separated us from God, and there's a penalty for that sin, and the penalty is truly death, and when I mean death, I mean a life completely without God. Even if you are not a believer, even if you're just like saying, I'm here today to explore who Jesus is, you have not lived one day without God being in control. But the penalty of sin is that one day you'll be in a place eternally separated from that loving God. If you've been soaping with us, we just finished the book of Joshua. Well done. I know those chapters were full of a lot of land being given out. But we are now in 1 Samuel and something that we see clear in all these books that we've been reading through Scripture, all these different Bible books, we see clearly how serious God takes sin. Story after story, we see humanity doing things with these selfish desires, thinking of ourselves before others, thinking of ourselves before God. A price needed to be paid. God created us, and humanity said, we don't want you, and we lived against the standard. Like any parent to a child, there's a punishment. There was a price that needed to be paid. There was a cost. And Jesus, Jesus paid that ransom for us. Jesus paid that cost for us. Jesus took the penalty for us. Come on, you know the verse, right? We've all said it if you've been in church any amount of time. We all heard the verse, right? John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will have eternal life. There it is, right? There it is. There's the answer we're looking for. How do we inherit eternal life? Through the one who loves us, through Jesus, through God, because God loved us. We can now have eternal life. If we believe in him, we can have a relationship with him that lasts for eternity. So I think, I truly think that we can argue before we can really love our neighbors, we have to love God. And before we can truly love God, we have to. We have to understand that God loves us. We have to understand that God loves us. God sent his son, his one and only son, to take our place on that cross, to be hung from a tree. And if we believe in him, if we understand what Jesus did for us, what God did with his son for us, if we begin to understand that and we begin to love him, we enter into this relationship with him that grants us, that gives us eternal life. Understanding Jesus' sacrifice, understanding the pain he took for our sins, for the sins of you and the sins of me and the sins of all the people of all the world, of all of history. If we understand that ultimate sacrifice, it helps us to truly understand what love really is and how much Jesus loves us. Back to that letter in 1 John. If you flip to 1 John 3.16, maybe it's important. Everything happens that, that's awesome is in a 3.16. But in 1 John 3.16, it says this, By this we know love that he laid down his life for us. This is real love. 
This is what love is. We love God and we love others because Jesus loved us first. Jesus laid down his life so that we could have a relationship with him, a relationship with God, and that we could begin to love God. We see that picture of true, perfect love, seeing Jesus' death and seeing his resurrection. And whoever, whoever truly believes that, truly believes that Jesus died and rose again for the sake of our sins, whoever truly believes that Jesus is truly the son of the living God who came to take away the sins of the world, whoever believes that has eternal life. Without a shadow of a doubt, if you believe Jesus is the son of the living God and you truly believe that, you have eternal life. If we truly understood the weight of our sin, and the weight of Jesus' death and his life, we couldn't help but love him. Because I know that's what you're thinking. I know you're thinking, well, Jesus agreed with the lawyer that we're just supposed to love God. Yes, there is no question that God loves us, but in a relationship, love goes both ways, doesn't it? When we're talking about a real committed relationship, love goes both ways. God clearly has shown his love for us. If we really believe that Jesus is who he says he is, if he truly is the son of God and we believe that and he took all of our sin, took the weight of all our sin, we could not help but fall in love with him. I remember when I was a teenager and I was watching the Passion of the Christ movie and I can remember sitting in my bedroom at the edge of my bed watching the beating and watching him carry the cross and watching all of it. And this was just a movie. And it was so much worse in reality than this movie could depict. I remember watching this movie, watching the scars, watching the death, and I remember thinking, he, Jesus did that for me. I remember thinking, Jesus, if he's real, if Jesus is actually real, he got beaten for me, for my sins. He got carried the cross and he dies on it for me. If this is true, I remember the moment, if this is true, I have to give him my life for him giving me his. I have to give Jesus everything for what he did for me. I remember thinking, I can't help but love him with all of my heart with all of my mind, with all of my soul, and all of my strength. Do you see? His love, Jesus' love becomes all-consuming. And our love for him becomes all-consuming. We have to understand that he loves us before we even began to love him. And once we love him, we realize that giving Jesus everything, giving Jesus all of our being, all of our mind, all of our soul, all of our strength, all of our heart, is incredibly worth it. Because he gave us everything first. So let's jump back into Luke 10. What's the next part with what this lawyer and Jesus says? He doesn't only say, love God, but he tells us what? To love our neighbors. Jesus says, go and do these things. We said it earlier, right? It's not about what we do, but it's about what God did for us. And this is true on all accounts. What gives us eternal life is the relationship that we have with God. He loves us and we love him. But a question I have to ask is, how do we show the love of God? How do we show the world our love for God? How do we show that God loves us and that we love him? Jesus conquered sin. He did. On that cross, he conquered sin. But I have to tell you, that does not mean he does not take sin seriously still. We read it over and over again in soap, and we're reading it now through our Bibles, that Jesus, that God himself, takes sin so seriously. And God still views sin as serious today, as he always did. But Jesus freed us from the hold 
that sin has on us. Think of it this way. It's like, and track with me here, stay with me here. It's like if sin was a phone before Jesus showed up, before we understood real love, any time that phone rang and it was sin calling, we could not help but answer it. Sin would call with lust or cheating on a spouse. Sin would call and lead to drunken nights or sometimes just knocking people down with our words. And we would answer that phone call of sin every time because that's where we thought that we could find our value in the world. We thought if we keep answering these things that we think will satisfy us, we will find value. We'll find love in these things. We would keep answering sin just to find value, to think maybe on the other end of this sinful phone call is our identity. When we were sad, we answered. When we were looking for escape, we answered. When life got hard, we answered. Every time trying to find love, trying to find love, we answered. And every time we answered, we realized that the other end of that phone had nothing to sustain us. But now, because of Jesus, because of his death on the cross and our belief in our relationship with him, when sin calls, we don't have to answer. Sin will continue to call. Our time here on earth, every day, sin will continue to call. Sin will continue to tempt us with a phone call and it says, hey, spend time with me and I'll show you eternity. I'll show you identity. I'll show you value. But we know that real value and real worth is not in the other end of those sinful temptations, but real, real worth, real identity is found only, only through Jesus Christ. Because we now know where real love finally comes from. We know real love isn't in the sinful lifestyles. It's not there. But what satisfies us is the real love we experience with him. I think what has happened over the years is people begin to hear that they just need to believe in God. If they believe in God, they will be good and they will be saved and they'll have eternal life forever. No matter how they live, if they just believe in God, they'll be good. And then it all stops there. Maybe they've prayed the prayer. And by that, I mean, you know the prayer. If you've been in church any sort of time, you heard the prayer that you maybe you heard it at a youth camp or maybe at a VBS or a church service where we pray to accept Jesus into our heart, but then nothing changes in our life. We're exactly the same as the moment before we prayed the prayer. Or maybe they did pray and they began to go to church and maybe they even put a sticker on their car that says he's the reason for the season. But it's so much more than that. No relationship is just built off that. We said that loving God is like a relationship. When we truly believe, if we truly believe in Jesus and begin to love Jesus, the Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit that raised Christ from the dead begins to dwell in us. He lives in us. He changes us from the inside out. When we really understand the love of God, when we really love him, something does actually change in our being. Something inside us changes. We are not the same. Yes, on the outside we may look the same, but on the inside something is different. We're much more than what we were. We are made new. And you can't see it from the outside, but something in me says, I'm a new creation. That's the Holy Spirit dwelling within me. Because when I believed I understood I was love and I couldn't help but love back. But too many times, too many times, we stop at the belief part. But believing and love is way more than just saying it. It's the actions that actually follow it. Our lifestyles, let me tell you today, church, our lifestyles will show what we actually and truly believe in. I understand this even more now. I understand this concept even more now being married. Telling Sharon, my wife, that I love her is one thing, but showing it through my actions, showing my love to her speaks more volumes and shows my love for her. It shows her that she's loved and it shows the world that I love her. But if I went around saying, I just believe Sharon exists, but I spend no time with her, I don't care about her likes or dislikes, you could argue that I don't know who my wife is or really even love her. That's how relationships work. We show love not just through our words, 
but through our actions. So how do we show that we love God? How do we show God that we love Him? How do we show the world our love for Him? Well, in John chapter 14, not the letter of John, but now back in the gospel, same author, Jesus is talking to His disciples, talking to those that He has a relationship with, talking about how He's preparing a place for them. Jesus is talking to the disciples about eternal life. He's saying, I'm going to prepare a place for you, for those who love me, for those who have a relationship with me. And then He says something that's almost so obvious, but yet so overlooked today. It says this in John 14, 15. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. If you love him, you will keep his commandments. We aren't meant to just stop at saying we love God. We have to show it through our obedience, our obedience to him by obeying his commands, by obeying the things that Jesus has asked of us. And what is he asking of us, right? Great question. He's asking us to love our neighbors, to love others, to love each other. Our obedience to God actually shows our love for him, not only to him, but our love and obedience actually shows the world our love for Jesus. Our obedience to God shows the world light in a dark place. And we can get this so backwards. We can get this so backwards, church. We think that if we obey God, then he will love us. But it really is that God loves us and we love him. And because we love him, because we love God, our desire becomes to obey him. But doesn't it sometimes feel like we spend too much time trying to convince each other not to sin? That we're trying to convince people to have a good behavior and then follow God. I think if we actually love God, we wouldn't really need to be convinced of anything. Don't you want to do what pleases him? If you really loved God, if you knew him and you believed in him and you truly loved him, what do you want to do? What do you have a desire to do what he loves, what he desires for us? But we spend so much time trying to get each other to read his word. Think about that. We believe that the Bible is the word of God and that we love him because of the words he's written to us and it tells us his good news, but then we have to be convinced to read it. Be convinced to read the words of the almighty God. But if we loved him, wouldn't we be in awe of the opportunity to get to read the words of the living, almighty, everlasting, beginning and end God. If we really believe this, if we believe this book was the words of God, wouldn't we just be tearing it apart? We wouldn't need to be convinced. I wouldn't need to convince anyone to read because we have eternity in the form of a book that we can read every single day and get to know him more and more. This book, the Bible, is like milk to a newborn child. It's the desires that we should have, tearing this book apart to get to know him more and more. How can we obey his commandments if we don't even know them? Because we don't read it for ourselves. When we find out a command of Jesus, we shouldn't need to be convinced or debate whether we actually need to follow it or actually need to do it. If we love him, we're just going to want to do it. If we don't want to just do things that displease God, we don't want to do things that make God unhappy. We don't want to do things that aren't a part of God's plan for our lives. We want to love him. I love Jesus more than anything. When I hear a command of his, and I see it plainly in scripture. I don't want to debate it. I just want to listen to it because I know that's his plan and desire for me. And I love him. I want to do anything that Jesus asks of me. And let me tell you just, just honestly, even if I don't agree sometimes or truly understand why God's asking these things, I believe who he says he is. I believe in who Jesus says he is. So whether I agree understand or don't, I will do everything in my power to follow it, to follow him. I believe that anything Jesus asks of us is far better than anything the world has to offer us. That's why Jesus can say it so simply, love God 
and love your neighbor as yourself. Go and do these things and you will live. That is eternal life. We don't get to debate this. There isn't a choice. Jesus' commands are so simple. That's why we built our whole church around them. Think about any relationship. If we were to define a loving relationship, there's commitment on each side, commitment to each other. I don't want to do things, right, that will make my wife upset. But my desire is to do things that would please her because I love her. The same is with God. He blesses us because he loves us. And if we are claiming to love him, shouldn't we obey him? Remember earlier, we looked at the letter of 1 John. It said this, it said, by this we know love that he laid down his life for us. It actually goes on and continues to say, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. This is the other believers. This is saying that God loves us, so we should love each other. This sounds so much like what Jesus is saying in Luke chapter 10. Go and do these things. Our love is not a passive thing that we say, but a call to obedience of what God calls us to do. Track with me here, don't lose me. The good deeds are not what gets us into heaven. It's our love for God that gives us eternal life. But we can't, love, we can't love God and not love people. We can't love God and then not have a desire to do what he says. For too long, we made it about behavior, just like the lawyer said, putting it on ourselves, saying if I look and act and I'm being a certain way, then I'll be able to get into heaven. And then we swung completely opposite way, saying, well, God's all love. God is all love, so we can do whatever we want, because as long as we believe in him, we're good. But what scripture lays out is clear. We don't have to overcomplicate in either direction. Our relationship with God gives us eternal life. And our love for God gives us a desire to do what he says. This is the story of the Good Samaritan. The lawyer put it on himself and said, what do I need to do? Love God and love your neighbor. And like so many of us, like all of us, the lawyer tried to find the loophole, right? Ah, but Jesus, who really is my neighbor, right? Who is my neighbor? There's so many variables to what's a neighbor. Is my neighbor the person that lives on the left and right of me? What about the person who lives across the street? Do they count as a neighbor? So then Jesus goes into the story of all these people who thought they had a relationship with God and continue to pass by and not do what was called of them. Not do what the Bible, what the scripture has commanded of them. They didn't love people. But how many of us are doing that? Sitting in the pews, or currently now sitting on her couches, hearing commands, feeling convicted, and then doing nothing. We are not meant to say we love God and sit week after week in church and that's it. Or in this case, week after week and not obeying and loving each other. We have to love our neighbors. Our neighbors are everyone around us. And today, in this culture, with all that is going on, we have to love each other. We have to go and love our neighbors. We cannot afford not to do this. We have to. If we do not love each other, the world will not see Jesus. The Bible tells us, right? It says this in scripture. The Bible tells us they will know him by our love. We are called to love each other supernaturally, right? The world will know of Jesus by our love. This is not just a regular love, but this is a supernatural love. More than being Facebook friends, more than just waving in public when we pass each other by, but we are to love each other like a family. That's what the church is, a family, a supernatural loving family. Do we see that? When it comes to our churches, do we see this love? Are we devoted to each other so supernaturally that everyone would see us and go, wow, that's a family? Or is it just an experience? And when family is in trouble, right? When the family that we experience Sunday after Sunday with is in trouble, or when things don't look like we want them to, or it doesn't sound the way we want it to, or it's inconvenient and we can't gather in person, Are we ready to move on to a new family? There's nothing super or natural about that. 
So I have to ask, do you love him? If you've never encountered Jesus before, today you have that opportunity. Don't wait. This reminds me of a, a few weeks ago, I was running, right? Because as we're social distance, we can't really go work out anywhere. So everyone's running. And I was running a few weeks ago. And as I was running, I was listening to a book on the topic of loving others and making disciples. And as I was running, I will never forget this story. As I was running, this guy starts screaming at me and waving me down who was on a bicycle. So I'm confused and I popped out my headphone and I kind of look at him and he screams, you look like Russell Wilson. And I remember saying, what? He goes, you look like Russell Wilson. And then takes out his phone, rides up next to me and begins to video himself saying, look, I'm, I'm running with Russell Wilson. I'm working out with Russell Wilson. And then at the end of the run, he stops his bike in front of me just to tell me how awesome it was that he bumped into me and that I look like Russell Wilson and he has it on his Snapchat. So of course, now I just can't go back to running. I'm listening to a book about how to make disciples and to love others with a supernatural love. A book about loving our neighbors. So then I ask him, this guy who says I look like Russell Wilson, I turn to him and say, hey man, how can I pray for you? And he looks down and he answers, ah, man, I don't know. I'm a single dad of four kids. I'm 27. My baby mama lives in Camden. There's too much to pray about. So I asked him, I even said this, I said, hey, this is going to be a weird question for you. Do you know who Jesus is? He then goes, I, I believe in a higher power. I just, I know I got to put the work in. If I become a good person, this is actually what he says. If I become a good person, then God will finally accept me. Talk about an opportunity when you're reading about the word of God, you're reading about making disciples, you're reading about loving others, others, and it's not about just the works. And he says, one day, if I get it right, maybe God will love me. Here's a guy who literally thinks he has to be a certain way for God to love him. And right there on the street, I told this man who Jesus was. And right there on the street, this man began to believe. We have all fallen short. We all messed up and continue to mess up. All of us. But Jesus loved us so much that he took all of our sins on the cross with him, took the punishment of sin and died in our place so that we could live forever. And then on the third day, he rose again, conquering death and showing he is who he said he was. Jesus is the son of the living God who has authority over heaven and earth and all things that were ever created. He laid down his life that we could have a relationship with him. And you have the opportunity to enter that relationship with him. And through this, through this love of each other, of God and man, we gain eternal life. There is no salvation in anyone else. No matter what the world tells you, no matter if you're a good person, quote unquote, or not, there is no salvation. There is no eternal life through anyone else but Jesus. There is only, there is only one person who can save us, Jesus. Love him. And then when you love him, go love your neighbor. And if you already know him, let me challenge you today, church. Do you love him? Not just know of him. Like we can know someone in our neighborhood, but not know anything truly about them. Do you love him? And I'm not talking about the love that you can say, hey, I love him like I love tacos. Do you love him so deeply that it's like a relationship with him? Do you love him? Have you ever had that moment where you doubted? And you thought to yourself, ah, I really hope, I really hope that I get into heaven. I don't think we have to doubt. I really don't. I don't think when I read scripture, it says I don't have to doubt if I'll make it into heaven. I can have a confidence. 
We don't have to doubt. Jesus' death and resurrection for us was eternal. But look at your life. Do you have the desires to obey him, to love him and obey his command and love others? If you examined your life today, would you see that you're just running back to other things, looking for other things to satisfy you, and Jesus is just a Sunday morning thing, just a routine? Let me ask you, do you really love him? So you see, there's just a lot. <laughs> there's a lot in this initial question of this passage. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Before we even get into the story, it starts off with a question that has to do with all of us. Maybe today, we all need to ask, our, ask ourselves this question. Do we know him and do we love him? I pray today that we get this and that we really understand that Jesus is truly the son of God. Maybe today, you need to take this moment and you need to choose to follow Jesus. Really follow him and what he says. You want to love him and love people. And it says that when we begin to love him, we choose to follow him, that his Holy Spirit will dwell within us and he will guide us. That's how we'll love our neighbors because he'll guide us too. He will guide us to love those around us. So I want to pray. I want to take a moment to pray, but remember that the prayer is not what saves you. This is just an acknowledgement of the beginning. But today, if you do not know Jesus and you want to make a decision to follow him right now and have his Holy Spirit dwell within you and know without the shadow of a doubt that you can have eternal life with him, would you just pray with me? Let's pray together. Jesus, who are we? Who are we that you could ever truly love us from all of the mistakes we make and all the ways we turn? But yet, God, you do. God, you said, I love them so much, I will give my one and only son to die in their place so that I can build a bridge, I can have that relationship back to them. God, today, we want to accept you into our lives. Jesus, maybe for the first time we want to say, I want to follow you. I want to understand your love and I want to follow you and I want to begin to love you. Jesus, today we make our decision to follow you with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind and all of our strength. Holy Spirit, guide us to love you even more. We welcome you into our lives, Jesus, and we want to follow you starting now. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. If you want to know more, like we said, it doesn't stop at a prayer. The prayer doesn't save us, it's the relationship that does. So I encourage you, if, you today, if today you're saying, I want to be in this relationship with Jesus, I want to have that relationship, I want to follow him, and I want to have eternal life in this, this beautiful relationship with Jesus, here's what I need you to do. If you prayed with us, if you decided to have that relationship, what you need to do is, will you email us? so that we can get in contact with you and point you into some right directions to plug you in, to show you what a real relationship with Jesus looks like. So email us at prayer at crossbridgecc.org. Or maybe you've been with us at Crossbridge a long time and you are listening. And if you're being honest and you're examining your life, you know that maybe this whole time you have not loved him, but you want to. I encourage you church member, church attendee, reach out to someone. Email us at that same e email, prayer at crossbridgecc.org, and one of the pastors will reach out to you, or maybe even say, hey, I want to I wanna talk about my love for God, and maybe even that my love's been lacking. Maybe you can't talk about it with my small group leader. Talk to someone. The decision that you make doesn't end with you praying a prayer and then just going back to normal tomorrow. Talk to someone and let's build relationships with each other, but more importantly, build a relationship with Jesus. Don't let today go by. Here's your challenge, church. New believer and believer who's been believing for a long time. Here's your challenge. Do not let today go by without talking to someone about who Jesus is. Whether you've said, you're going to say, I just met him, or whether you say, I love him so much, I need to tell you about him. This is the best way 
to love your neighbor as yourself. Let's pray one more time. God, thank you for this word that you have in Luke 10. Jesus, we want to love you. Holy Spirit, guide us. Guide us into what it truly means to love you. And Holy Spirit, since you dwell within us, will you help us to truly understand that you love us? We thank you, Jesus, for all that you're doing. We know you hear our prayers. We know that the things going on in this world are not, you're not ignoring them, you're not blind to them, but you're in the midst of them and you're working through it. May we be the light in the dark place. May our love for each other supernaturally show our love for you. We pray all these things in Jesus' holy, precious name. Amen. See you later, Crossbridge. Thanks so much for connecting with us this morning at Crossbridge Online. We love that we get to be the church even when we can't physically be together. We'll see you again next week, same time, same place. Until then, keep up to date online at crossbridgecc.org.